Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Diasorn Molecular Workshop. My name is Michelle Tab. I'm the Chief Scientific Officer for Diasorn Molecular, and it's my pleasure today to introduce this workshop. And we have Dr. Jackie Chow from MultiCare Health System, who will speak to us today about his experience with our uh, Bordadella Pertussis product. But before I introduce Dr. Chow, I just wanted to say a few words about our system. So for those of you who do not know our system, it's shown here on the left. This is our Liaison MDX. This is a four-color real-time PCR instrument, but it's extremely unique. It ha offers two different consumable formats that are shown here, two different disks. We have the 96-well disk, which is akin to a 96-well plate. And then we also have the sample to answer 8-well disk for direct testing. We're really unique because besides these two formats, we also offer both IVDs and then the components to have um, lab developed test development. So those would be things like master mixes and ASRs. We actually have more than 50 ASRs available in that menu. And within our software, it's a simple selection to go between the IVD mode and then the user defined mode for lab developed tests. If we focus on the 8-well disk products, which is our sample to answer CLIA moderate complexity products, it has a very simple and easy workflow. So there's no precise pipetting required, and there's actually no separate DNA or nucleic acid extraction step that's required. The hands-on time for setup is shown here. It's all barcode driven. So you can see there you scan the vial of reaction mix, followed by scanning the barcode on the side of the disk followed by scanning your patient sample. So that setup time and loading takes about less than one minute per sample. And then runs typically take between 60 and 75 minutes, and you're not extracting. So there's not, not that bottleneck in terms of the workflow. In terms of our current menu of Simplexa kits, uh, they're shown here. On the left-hand side are the products that are in that eight-well disk format. So we started with FluAV RSV, and we also have HSV 1 and 2 for both CSF and mucocutaneous and cutaneous swabs. So actually, that's a really unique offering. We're the only ones in the industry that offer both kinds of testing, both FTA cleared um, intended uses for that HSV detection. We have group A strep, as well as C. diff, Bordadella, which you'll hear about more today, as well as group B, and then VZV CSF. And um, also, just to mention, we do have products in our 96 well format that are also FDA cleared, both for flu ABRSV, for C. diff, and then now we actually have a CE marked product for HSV VZV detection directly without extraction as well on that 96 well disk. So just to highlight our most exciting development lately, which is that we are now FDA cleared for our Simplexa VZV direct detection from cerebral spinal fluid. Um, we're excited to offer this because it's also complementary to our other clearance, which is for HSV detection from CSF. Um, it's the newest member of our product line, and to help celebrate that, I invite you all to attend a champagne toast this evening at our booth, which is number 1043. Um, you can probably see it right over that way with the DSORN molecular sign. And uh, both tonight as well as Saturday night from 4 to 5 o'clock, uh, come and join us for a glass of champagne to toast. Now, just to concentrate on that product for one moment, I just wanted to highlight some of the features of it because it really highlights the features of our other sample to answer testing in the 8-well format. And so uh, the assay is intended for use uh, to distinguish between encephalitis, meningitis, suspected patients, and detect the VZV virus directly from CSF. No separate extraction step required. It only requires 50 microliters of CSF, so that also makes us quite unique. Only a small amount of CSF. It takes about 70 minutes. You can run from one to eight samples at a time in our, our uh, direct amplification disk format. And then also just to highlight the performance of this product. So we ran more than 600 prospective CSF samples through this test. And you can see we have a 100% positive agreement and 99.7% negative agreement, as well as uh, the testing on contrived samples, which should be no surprise. We detected 100% of those. But the performance is very nice. It's very sensitive, similar to what you'd expect and we've already seen with our HSV test for CSF. And just lastly to mention the other products that we have in development for this 8-well disk format that are in the R&D teams, both in Milan and also in Southern California. We are following on, just like we did with HSV, not only getting that CSF claim for VZV, but continuing on to that with the mucocutaneous and cutaneous swab claims. And we intend to be submitting to FDA this fall, and so look for FDA clearance on that product line soon. 
Um, what's also really interesting about our BCV and HSV offerings is that they run with the same cycling parameters, so they can run side by side in adjacent wedges on our disk, and you can have joint reporting off that same specimen if you desire. We also have atypical pneumonia in development for detection of mycoplasma pneumoniae, chlamydia pneumoniae, and legionella pneumophila from BAL and sputum samples, as well as um, detection of NPN and CPN from NP swabs. And we also have congenital CMV in development for detection in newborns less than 21 days from both urine and saliva swab samples. So look for all of those products coming soon, and uh, I'd be happy to talk about the, any of those more with you after the talk as well. So that brings me to introduce today's speaker. It's Dr. Jackie Chow. He has a master's in bioengineering from University of California, San Diego, and he completed his PhD at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine Department of Microbiology and Immunology, followed by completing his clinical micro postdoc work in University of Washington, Seattle. Since 2015, Dr. Chow has been the technical director of the Infectious Diseases Diagnostic Laboratory at Multicare in Tacoma, Washington, where he oversees the microbiology laboratories at Tacoma General, Mary Bridge Children's Hospital, Good Samaritan Hospital, Auburn Medical Center, and Allen Moore Hospital. And the title of his talk today is The Challenges and Opportunities in Combating Pertussis. Welcome, Dr. Chow. Hello, can you guys hear me okay? Perfect. So uh, first of all, thank you, Michelle, for your kind introduction, and thank you for the opportunity for, for me to be here today. So um, today, I'm going to talk to you about uh, pertussis, and this is a very uh, significant, in, significant disease and also with uh, very interesting features. So I'm going to kind of go through the clinical presentation, um, the diagnosis, and also uh, something about uh, the vaccination. Here's my disclosure. So pertussis, also known as whooping cough, and also 100-day cough, it's caused by uh, Bordetella species, and the two major species of Bordetella causing pertussis is Bordetella pertussis and also Bordetella prepertussis. This disease is highly transmissible through the droplets from coughing and sneezing, and this, since the disease is so uh, highly contagious, it is of very significant public health concern, and it's also a reportable condition. Common symptoms of pertussis include coryza, low-grade fever, coughing, sneezing, and uh, paroxysmal cough, and also the whooping sound during the uh, paroxysmal uh, stage. Now, we have to keep in mind, though, certain, in certain infections, the symptoms may be mild and nonspecific. Uh, sometimes when uh, adolescents and adults develop disease, the symptoms are very mild and uh, uh, not as severe as infants or young children. Complications of pertussis may happen. Uh, these are the common uh, complications, including uh, syncope, uh, rib fracture because of the uh, severe coughing, and then in infants, pneumonia, seizure, encephalopathy, they are the common complications in infants. And before the use of vaccination uh, worldwide, uh, pertussis actually cause a lot of death. Now, even up to now, around the world, pertussis is still causing a lot of problem and death um, um, in, in infants. The incubation period of pertussis usually is between uh, five to 10 days. Uh, it can take up to 21 days. And as I, as I mentioned before, the early onset symptoms is pretty mild. You may have coryza, coughing, sneezing, and then during the process mode stage, then the disease tend to intensify and you would have more severe coughing. And then you would uh, cough for like a uh, uh, continuous five to 10 or even 15 episodes. And then you have to take a deep breath and that's where you catch that whooping sound. <laughs> kind of like that. <laughs> because you are taking deep breath, right? So the last stage of the disease course is a convalescent stage, which can take uh, uh, between eight, eight weeks to 12 weeks, and that's why it was given the name 100-day cough, because it lasts for months. Other than Bordetella pertussis and uh, uh, Bordetella parapertussis, there are two other species in the Bordetella family that can cause infections in humans. The first one is uh, Bordetella homesii, 
and the infection of homsii is often underdiagnosed because these particular species shared uh, some similar uh, genetic material with volatile potassus. So sometimes it may be misdiagnosed by the PCR. On the other hand, Botatella uh, bronchiseptica, it doesn't really cause uh, in infection in humans very often. It mostly causes infections in, in mammals. And when it causes human infections, a lot of times the host is actually immunocompromised or they may have some other underlying conditions that kind of leads to the res respiratory diseases by uh, bron bronchiseptica. Both species listed here, they don't have vaccine uh, that can prevent the disease at this point. This table lists some of the virulence factors of Botatella. Uh, they can be categorized into two major groups. Uh, the top group highlighted in uh, blue, those are the toxins being secreted by the bacteria. And the toxins, what it does is actually reduce the macrophage uh, um, response and also it would uh, modulate the T cell response from the whole cell. So therefore, the uh, whole cell response is actually being uh, reduced to fight against this particular bacterium. Now the second group of the virulence factors, including the fimbrae, the hemoglobin, and also the protectin, those are for the adherence of the bacteria to the epithelial cells where the infections happen. Since we have so many virulence factors of Botatella, it is pretty uh, common or it, it's, it's, it makes sense to imagine we can actually use these virulence factors to design our vaccines uh, to fight against the Botatella disease. <coughs> As I mentioned, um, we are still having potassium around the world and this data is from the CDC. So this data showing here, it's pertaining to the United States data only, not the whole world. But what we are seeing here is in the early 90s, we have quite a lot of infection by Botatella, especially potassium. Now once we introduce the whole cell vaccine, you can see the number of cases drop significantly to a very low number. And during the, 99, early, during the early 1990s, we also introduced the acellular vaccine to reduce the side effect of the vaccination. After that, you can see we are having a resurgence of potassium cases. So this is a very interesting phenomenon, and I'm gonna go uh, uh, a, lot, a lot deeper uh, in the next couple of slides to explain why this resurgence of potassium may happen. Now, take a, let's take a step back and look at um, the whole vaccine. So what a whole cell vaccine is, basically, is the suspension of the bacterium. After it's being inactivated, then it will be introduced to the host as a vaccine. Now you can imagine the whole cell includes all the cellular materials, including the virulence factors that I mentioned, and also some of the endotoxin uh, that is produced by, um, by the bacteria. So it's not hard to imagine the side effect or the immunogenicity. It's relatively high compared to some other form of vaccines. And this paper in JAMA, published in 1992, kind of summarized what kind of uh, side effects um, that a recipient, a vaccine recipient may, may, may see. I'd like to point out though, autism, it's not one of the side effects. There is no evidence to show vaccine cause autism. I wanna make it clear. One reason why we switched from the whole cell vaccine to a cellular vaccine is because of the high immunogenicity of the whole cell vaccine. Now, that switch in the United States was made in about 1994. And you can imagine after we wait for a little while, 10 years later, then we can keep track on how the vaccine is actually doing in terms of protecting children from having potassium. So there, there, there were uh, quite a lot of studies coming out about 2010, just to describe the efficacy of the acellular vaccines compared to the whole cell vaccines. Now, much to our surprise, other than the reducing um, immunogenicity of the acellular vaccine, we actually observed less protection from the acellular vaccine in general compared to the whole cell vaccine. 
Now, this is pretty surprising. As uh, indicated by this paper here, teenagers, when they were infants, uh, who received the whole cell vaccines, they actually had less disease, uh, less metastasis disease compared to the children who received the acellular vaccines. Uh, that proportion was also um, lower in the mixed uh, batch of uh, acellular vaccine with the whole cell vaccine uh, group. More importantly, if you use a three component vaccine, versus a five component vaccine. The three component acellular vaccine will give you less protection compared to the five component, a five component acellular vaccine. Five component acellular vaccine basically gives you more immune response to protect you. So therefore, um, it is preferred over the three component vaccines. This is a landmark paper in the New England Journal of Medicine showing how the immunity induced by the vaccine can win over the years. On the right-hand side, you can see the rate of having positive protesters will increase with time. And by the time, by the time you hit about six to eight years after you receive the vaccine, the rate of developing the disease is about 20%. So that's why people are working very hard to come up with a better vaccination schedule so that having booster vaccination will help uh, maintain that immunity induced by the vaccines. Now that we have all these studies showing we have winning immunity given by the acellular vaccine, what do we, do we actually know why it's causing that winning immunity or why the acellular vaccine is actually not as good as the whole cell vaccine. This study using non-human primate, uh, a baboon model, basically shows that the acellular vaccine can prevent disease, but it cannot clear the colonization as well as um, stopping the transmission from one host to another. On the left-hand side here, basically, is the disease model. And we have four groups here. The, the blue one is the naive group, meaning that it does not, the baboon does not receive any uh, vaccine. The red group here is the acellular vaccine. And the white is the whole cell uh, vaccine. And then finally, the green group is a previous infected baboon, which already had immunity and antibodies inside the system. So as you can see here, the acellular vaccine seem to protect the host from getting the disease. And the outcome parameters here is the white blood, ce white blood cell count, uh, because the increase of white blood cell count is a pretty um, um, classic presentation of, of having potassium. On the right-hand side here, on the right-hand side here, The acellular vaccine group have a pretty similar response and the CFU can compare to the naive group, which we know that it does not have the vaccine to, to cover uh, um, the, the infection. But at the same time, the whole cell vaccine group seems to have a better protection and therefore you can see the, the reduction of CFU at an earlier date. So basically, the left-hand side tells you it can help with the disease control, but it doesn't stop the colonization. And then the last figure here shows you the tra transmission from one baboon, the red solid line, to another baboon keep at the same cage, the, the dotted line here. And the first baboon was receiving the acellular vaccine. So even though the baboon was receiving the acellular vaccine, it still passes or the transmit the, uh, the bacterium to um, the, uh, uh, the neighbor baboon in the same cage. And the blue one basically it's a second pair showing the same result. So they have two pairs of baboons in two different cages. Showing the transmission of potassium is still possible even though if you receive the acellular vaccine. And then here in this figure, I wanna show you the immune response induced by the 
uh, acellular vaccine, it's different from the cellular vaccine. So the acellular vaccine primarily gives you the cytokine of IL-5, which is the interleukin-5 uh, as a cytokine response, while the, the uh, natural infection and the whole cell response primarily give you uh, a TH helper cell uh, immune response. So why is this important? Follow-up study shows that if you have a TH helper cell response, it actually boosts the T cell um, protection and also it helps with the proliferation. If you have an acellular vaccine as a prime and then followed by the T tap boosters, you would basically uh, generate a different type of immune response compared to the whole cell response. So you can see, even though the T tap boosters, they are the same, but if, you, if, if, a, if an infant is primed it with a different vaccine, say whole cell versus a cellular vaccine, the immune response developed later on will be quite different, primarily on the IL-17 production. So this is very significant because using both the primate model and using some of the uh, uh, human studies, we have shown that the TH17 response is quite critical in combating uh, potassium disease. For the next couple of slides, I'd like to show you uh, some data in terms of the epidemiology of the disease. Uh, this study basically uh, shows you the strains of the potassium during the outbreak in the United States between 2010 and 2012. So you can see here, 2010, we have a pretty big outbreak in California, and then United States overall between the two, the next two years, we have about 385 cases that was recorded in this study. And in Washington, we also had a pretty big outbreak in 2012. And when they strain type the potassium um, uh, bacteria, they find out a lot of them, they are having less and less protectin in those strains. So meaning that a lot of the strains that's causing the outbreak, they actually lack the protectin. And protectin, it's one of the component in the acellular vaccine. Interestingly, Japan is observing a different phenomenon, basically the opposite phenomenon. Now in California, United States, we are seeing increase of protectin deficient strains, while Japan is seeing a decrease of protectin deficient strain. And do we know why? Maybe. Oh, sorry. So here is a table showing you two different types of the acellular strain, uh, acellular vaccine. This one is a five component, which include the frimbrate type two and type three. And this one is the acellular vaccine that is three component, not including the frimbrate. Uh, third one here is the whole cell vaccines, which include the whole cell uh, Bartella uh, potassium. Now, as I mentioned, protectin is one of the component in the vaccine. And if you have a vaccine, including the protectin, and if you're seeing the outbreak, that kind of gives you an idea of why or how this protectin in the acellular vaccine is driving the uh, selection of protectin deficient strains. Let's go back to the case in Japan. The acellular vaccine in Japan was actually induced a lot earlier, about 10 years earlier than in, in the United States. It was introduced back in 1981. And not surprisingly, you would see protectin deficient strain being increased in early 2000 because of the selection pressure. In about 2010, there are certain acellular vaccines that Japan used that does not have the protectin anymore. And as a result, because of the lack of the selection pressure, they also observed the reduction of protectin deficient strain. So it's kind of like antibiotics. If you have uh, a strong use of antibiotics, then you may build up resistance against that particular antibiotics. And when you leave the antibiotics and not use it, and rather go with an alternative, then that antibiotics uh, pressure, it's, it's gone. And you may see a different 
uh, epidemiology in terms of uh, the resistance patterns. So it's quite similar in terms of the vaccine development and also the, uh, um, the uh, particular strain of protesters here. And I want to bring to your attention that not only now we have the protestant defic deficient uh, strain, but we also have a double mutant that was uh, first reported in the uh, EID paper. Basically, that particular strain causing an infection in New York was found to have no protectin and also have no protestant toxin. This is the first strain that was being recorded to have two, uh, lacking two acellular uh, vaccine immunogens. Rather or not, we're gonna see more and more of this type of mutants, we don't know, but it is definitely a possibility. We have focused a lot on uh, volatile protasis outbreaks. Something to mention about, about the uh, volatile protasis outbreak is, uh, it's not quite uh, prevalent yet, but we are seeing cases and certain outbreaks in local areas, uh, including Wisconsin and also Minnesota. So I have been focusing on the negative side of vaccination and how the strain or the bacteria have been kind of escaping the immune response. Now I want to focus more on a little bit on the positive side, what we have learned from our research. And uh, this paper in uh, Science Translation of Medicine, basically using mathematical model to show that vaccination is still very effective, reducing overall disease dissemination. But at the same time, we need to be a little bit more smart in vaccinating the right population group. And in this particular paper, they find out vaccinating the school children will have the most cost benefit uh, uh, in, in uh, stopping the disease or reduce the transmission of the disease. Also, in order to prevent the disease in infants, it's also recommended to vaccinate uh, pregnant women in the third trimester so that they can produce the antibody and pass along to the infant so that when the infant was born, then they would have natural immunity from the mom. Uh, if you cannot do that, they also recommend a secondary strategy, which is vaccinate uh, the people or the family members near uh, the infants, say the mom, father, family members, and friends which may come close in contact with the infants. So that would be the second strategy to protect the infant if uh, the mom did not have any vaccination during the third trimester. So I'm gonna switch gear a little bit to talk about the laboratory diagnosis of potassium. So there are multiple ways for diagnosing this uh, uh, disease or uh, detecting this, this type of bacteria. Most of the time we use PCR, we use culture, we use serology. Each one of them, they have their pros and cons. Serology is not very good for young kids because they don't have a good immune uh, system yet. So antibody production, it's not quite prominent. So therefore, uh, for young infants, PCR and uh, culture, they are still uh, the primary way to diagnose the disease. Uh, it also depends on the clinical cause of the disease. If it's early onset, culture and PCR are recommended. And if it's later during the convalescent stage or late uh, stage of uh, processmal stage, then serology may be a little bit more helpful. So each method, they do have their own pros and cons and turnaround time and sensitivity and specificity. Culture, it's the conventional way of um, identifying volatile species. Uh, it is about 60% sensitive during the early onset and um, very specific because basically you can identify it using selective arbor. Uh, the growth time for volatile protesters and paraprotesters can take up to a week. And as I mentioned, you would need a specific arbor to select this group of bacteria out from other flora. Serology, it's not often used anymore because of the long turnaround time. And in order to do this, basically you have to have a pair of uh, uh, samples and you're looking for fourfold increase of antibody titer. And since the turnaround time is relatively long compared to the culture or the molecular assay, 
uh, it is not commonly used for diagnosis purpose or it's not commonly used for uh, prophylaxis decision anymore because by the time you realize that, it has been four weeks already. So I'm gonna spend the rest of the time talking about the molecular assay um, and in particular, the multi-center study uh, using the DSRM protesters direct assay. PCL is still the most sensitive and specific uh, methodology to detect water teller. While it is sensitive and specific, it is not super straightforward when you look at when you first look at the table. So there are multiple targets that are specific to certain groups of water teller species. Across the row here, you would have insertion sequence or IS481, 1001, 1002. These are genes that have multiple copies in the protasis or the Bordetella species. Say for example, for Bordetella protasis, you would have about 50 to 200 copies of the IS481, while you have less copy of Bordetella homesii. And remember, I told you before, the homesii may be mis misdiagnosed as Bordetella protasis because of these detection of IS481. Now on the other hand, if you look at IS-1001, it's only available in uh, paraprotesis and also some of the uh, bronchoseptica strains. Uh, IS-1002, it's available in uh, protesis and also paraprotesis, but not in home CI. So if you use a combination of the 481, 1001, and 1002, you may be able to separate all these four species uh, fairly easily. Now on top of these multi-copy genes, uh, there are certain studies that looked into the potassium toxin gene and also the RAC A gene that is only available in HOMCI. So using different combination of these multi-copy genes or the single copy gene as the potassium uh, toxin, you may be able to uh, accurately diagnose or ac accurately identify um, different volatile species. The multi center evaluation of the Soren Volatile Direct Assay was uh, uh, organized and conducted in eight hospitals. St. John Hospital, Beaumont Health, uh, Cleveland Clinic, Cook Children's, uh, Multi-Care System, Hershey Medical Center, Texas Children's, and also University of Minnesota. So I'd like to uh, extend my thanks to my colleagues uh, who conducted this study and also have collected the data. A little bit about the assay itself. It's a very simple and easy to use assay. It's a, a sample to result type of, speci um, of, an, of an assay. Basically, you just need 50 microliter of the NPS um, uh, in a transport medium. And then you can run up to eight samples at a time and the run time is about 60 minutes. This assay is moderately complex and you can place, say in our lab, we have uh, actually multiple instruments that can be run at the same time depending on the need and depending on the volume. We can also run uh, this assay around the clock, so basically e even during the night shift, we can uh, uh, run the potassium assay and some other assays on this same platform. So this is the uh, results summarizing the performance of, of the study. And uh, this particular table is showing you the uh, uh, bottle teller potassium detection, and the para potassium is coming up next. So we have eight sites and compared to different molecular methods, including some of the LDT, some of the assays that are currently available out there. And we have a very good positive percentage agreement and the total per positive percentage agreement is about 98%. And the negative percent percentage agreement is about 97%. Now I have to point out, other than these two LDT here, you can see this negative percentage agreement is less than 100%. And the reason is because when we use the original assay to detect or to diagnose uh, uh, Bordetella, they came back as a negative result using this reference assay. But when we run the same specimen in the DSRN uh, direct assay, it turns out to be a positive result. So that's why we have the negative percentage agreement less than 100%. And you can see it happens in six out of eight sites, kind of indicating that uh, the DSRN assays uh, may have a, a higher sensitivity compared to some other molecular assays in the market. Out of these eight sites, uh, we were able to resolve some discrepant results using uh, 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 an alternative PCR method, which is a very sensitive assay as well. 
And after resolving the discrepance results, uh, we have a sensitivity of 100% and specificity of 99.4%. So the performance of the DSRN potassium star assay is actually uh, very uh, promising. And then this table here indicates the, uh, the results on the, uh, the volatile power potassium. Um, very high negative percent agreement. Basically, all the negatives are called the same. And you can see there is a zero percent here. And I apologize, that's from MultiCare, so that's from my lab. And we only had one uh, power potassium that was detected using the ASR. But then uh, when we run it on the direct assay, it was negative. But when we uh, review the data, it was a very late CT. So we know that is a uh, low positives. So given that, we have a very good uh, percent, positive percent agreement and also a very good negative percentage agreement uh, uh, looking at the power potassium uh, data. And then uh, we have two sites that perform a uh, limb of detection study. And this is one of the sites comparing uh, the uh, simplexer, the uh, uh, disorient direct assay with the LDT. And you can see it detects uh, uh, down to thir uh, three fem femtogram uh, per microliter, which is a very sensitive, very low quant of, of DNA material. And paraprotesis also detect to uh, 10 femtogram per, mil uh, per micro microliter um, of, of DNA in the specimens. So I would say the limit of detection are quite comparable to the LDT here, even though the LTT seems to have a little bit higher uh, sensitivity here. And another site using uh, bacterial culture inoculum um, find out the uh, volatile potassium has a sensitivity of or, low, or limit of detection of 150 cmU per mil, and for bioprotesis, they have about 1,500 uh, cmU per mil. So to summarize, protesis is a resurgent disease and very highly contagious, and we know that it's of uh, healthcare uh, concern, and public health, it's, public health, it's also uh, a big, it's threat to public health, it's also a big concern, and that's why we tried to work on uh, different diagnosis assay and also worked on uh, better vaccination schedule, better vaccination uh, strategy to prevent the disease and try to uh, um, give a kickback to, to, to that uh, uh, bacteria infections. Uh, molecular technology is still the recommended method to diagnose protesters because of the high sensitivity and specificity. Uh, short turnaround time uh, will flavor the timely treatment and also infection control. Uh, Simplasa direct assay, as I showed it to you, has very comparable um, sensitivity and performance compared to other molecular assays. And in fact, it seems like the uh, sensitivity of the DSRN assay is a little bit higher than other commercial, uh, uh, commercially available assays. And based on our own uh, data, even though I haven't shown you here, um, the indeterminate call by the new assay by the uh, DSRN potassium direct assay, it's uh, less than the ASR assay that we have used uh, previously. So that's also uh, quite promising. Um, so with that, that would summarize my presentation. And uh, I'll be happy to take any questions from, from all of you. And uh, thank you very much for your attention. And thank you for coming. Thank you for your talk, Vitalis Inchenko, uh, Sydney, Australia. Uh, can I ask you to, uh, to comment on different types of specimens? You showed uh, that you can do this testing on nasopharyngeal aspirates. Um, what about throat swabs? So for now, for now only nasopharyngeal swab, so only NPS. But we did test uh, both the fresh specimen and the frozen specimens, and they do have very comparable performance. Okay, because obviously, if you limit your, yourself to NPAs, uh, 
it will be just for small children <clears throat> and pertussis in teenagers and older children might be under-recognized. That's right. <clears throat> so, uh, just want to clarify, uh, the claim here, the uh, IVD claim, it's for the swap, but not for the aspirin. Just want to make sure. So Michelle had a question about the workflow and uh, our experience on using the uh, uh, DSRN potassium assay. So we really like the assay in terms of the easiness because of the turnaround time and also you can actually run the assay, you don't have to batch them. So basically any, when, when specimens comes in, any of our shifts can run the assay with a very fast turnaround time. So in terms of the workflow, it actually helps a lot. Um, you don't have to batch them, and you can run as little as one sample, and you can run uh, um, up to eight samples using one equipment. But like I said, if you have more equipment, then that would increase the capacity of specimens. Any other questions? Or one more. Yeah, I had a question um, about, you showed the increasing, the strains were increasing for the, um, they were deficient in the, um, I forget what the biomarker was. Would um, you mind speak up a little bit, sorry. You had uh, the slide showing the strains that were increasing in the outbreaks mm -hmm. that were deficient in right. protectin, um, uh -huh. protectin yeah. Right. Um, have you seen that with any of the other components of the acellular vaccine? Um, I don't think, I think the protectin deficient strains are one of the primary strains that people look into. Um, I, I'm not sure if other strains with lacking of other emergence have caused the same scale of the outbreak. It probably it's out there, but I don't think they have caused the same scale of outbreaks yet. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much.